Hey everyone, and uh, welcome to another video uh, brought to you by Advocates for Direct Democracy. And I want to talk to you today about uh, the recent news uh, of the Fed Bank, the Federal Reserve Bank, uh, inject in injecting more money into the economy, uh, as uh, this is uh, a clear indication that things are really starting to get even worse. Uh, every time the uh, the Fed Reserve uh, or the New York Fed or any state or, or, or national bank has to inject more money into the market, then you know that the uh, Ponzi scheme is uh, essentially coming to an end. All right, so I want to start off by showing you a chart. Of course, this uh, was uh, in uh, 2008, the financial crash. Now they call this the Great Recession, but, accor but according to some historians, the uh, the Great Depression was even worse. So, but I guess they're not making that comparison. But anyways, uh, I, so I just want to show you some of the information that's on this chart. By the way, this is a, a great chart with a lot of good information. Uh, housing prices fell 31.8 percent. Of course, uh, people had loans that they couldn't pay. Uh, the jobs were drying up and, and essentially they were out in the streets and uh, lost everything that they had that, uh, to purchase that home in terms of the down payments and stuff. So um, that was uh, one thing that happened. Of course, uh, the unemployment, uh, according to the, this chart here in 2010, was still above 9%. Now, now it, you have to understand the numbers when you, when you see the unemployment rate. There's there's unemployment and then there's under uh, unemployment. So essentially the under unemployment are the people that have uh, were on, uh, on uh, employment insurance, but then of course it ran out, but still couldn't find jobs. So now they're really destitute. Um, they essentially have no assistance from the government whatsoever. So one, uh, 144.5 billion moved from money markets to treasury bonds. Um, now here's some interesting and I, well these the, these ten bits of information probably make you up or, or get you upset because I know it did for me. But 30 million federal guarantee for deal between Bear Stearns and J.P. Morgan Chase, 182 billion federal bailout for AIG, which later on the Treasury sold for profits. Uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac guaranteed 90 percent of all mortgages, but not for the people. Those are essentially for the banks. They they were going to, going to insure. Now, I want to talk to you about uh, Iceland. Now, Iceland, because like I said, this um, this meltdown of two thousand and eight really if it was a global recession essentially, okay, and uh, everybody was affected by it. But I want to uh, talk about Iceland in particular because it, something very interesting happened in Iceland. It all crashed, and the the banks needed to be bailed out. Uh, but what happened in Iceland, actually, the opposite happened in America. The people were bailed out in Iceland. The CEOs of the three top banks in Iceland were all arrested. Uh, for a time there, uh, the prime minister of Iceland was actually arrested, but then he was later uh, released. Uh, so you can see the difference of how they treat the people in Iceland uh, as opposed to the people in the United States. Not one single U.S. citizen was helped or even saved or even told, look, keep your house. This is our mess. We're going to clean it up. This was a result of greed. Okay? They were loaning out mortgages to people they knew couldn't afford. But they did it anyways because they didn't care about the results. All they cared about were their commissions and running away, uh, stealing millions of dollars. As far as I'm concerned, it's stealing. And they essentially left the people uh, homeless. And there was no absolutely no safety net whatsoever. Now, it gets me upset when I hear Americans talk about, you know, America's trying to be a socialist country. Not even close. What you have in Iceland is socialism. To a certain degree, what you have in the states is an oligarchy, is a plutocracy, is is more accurate, and 
uh, people have to start waking up to this and start realizing that people in America have to stop being patriot or stop patronizing or, or start, uh, uh, stop being a patriot to your country because your country is, is not really that loyal to you. All right, so I want to I want to bring up some news articles. Now this one is out of the CBC, which is the Canadian Broadcast Corporation here in Canada. And the title here is uh, what's happening in the repo loan market and why does it matter? And I'll, I'll read this uh, bit of information. Now, keep in mind that this is a news article from, from September 19th, 2019. Uh, and it states here that rates in obscure part of U.S., Lending market spiked this week, prompting fears of broader problems. Now, this is back in 2019. Now, it says here that uh, cash available to banks for their short-term funding needs all but dried up earlier this week, and interest rates in U.S. money markets shot up to as high as 10% for some overnight loans, uh, more than four times the Fed's rate. So now that there's a shortage of money, they have to increase the rates, the, the interest rates. Okay, depending on the bank that you're, you're, you're borrowing money from. So this, uh, this forced the Fed to make an emergency injection of more than $125 billion over the past two days. Its first major market intervention since the financial crises more than a decade ago to prevent borrowing costs from spiraling even higher. While the effort restored a measure of order to the short-term bank funding market, it was not enough to stop the Fed's benchmark lending rate from rising this week above its Targeted range of 2% to 2.25%. So, I mean, this is nuts. Okay, look, the, the government is actually, they're, they're creating money, which uh, uh, according to some economics or economists is a no-no. Because uh, they say that that money actually infl inflates. The more money you pump into the, into the economy, um, the less value it has. Now, I'm, I'm uh, one that money should have no value whatsoever. It's just a means to an end. You, you use it to purchase things that you need. Um, and some would even argue that uh, some of the essentials, like housing, like education, like food, water, those are things that you should not pay because those are things that you need. But here is an example of a Ponzi scheme in full motion. Every time the bank dries up, they ask for more money and they get it. And of course, this causes massive inflation, cost of living goes up, rent goes up. I mean, the wages are still stagnant. If, in, in some cases, they actually went lower. So this is a Ponzi scheme that needs to stop. Okay, so fast forward. And this is out of the, um, the Wall Street Journal. And this is just very recent, January 14th, 2020. And Fed adds $82 billion to financial markets. So again, back in 2019, they pumped more money. Fast forward to January 14th, only what, three months later? Another $82 billion to financial markets. Again, pumping up the Ponzi scheme. All right, so in this um, paragraph, it, it reads, Fed repo interventions take in U.S. treasuries, agency, and mortgage bonds from eligible banks in what is effectively a sh uh, short-term loan of central bank cash collateralized by the securities. Banks eligible to access these operations, the firms are called primary dealers, are limited in the amount of liquidity they can tap from the Fed. Well, uh, uh, apparently... That's not really the case because the central banks keep pumping more and more money into uh, into a Ponzi uh, Ponzi scheme system that uh, that really never works. It just works for a very few. All right, so here's the now that was the uh, the Fed, and this is the New York Fed. Okay. All right. Now let me blow this up a little bit and uh, this is in uh, of last year uh, it's still recent 
somewhat the 3rd of December. Uh, New York Fed adds another $97.9 billion in liquidity yesterday. Concerns grow of a year-end financial crisis. You can see the graph here how it just drops, spikes a little bit. But again, $97.9 billion into a Ponzi scheme. Why don't we take all this money that the, the Americans are spending, the, the, the Federal Reserve and the New York Fed, and put it back into the economy. Of course, they don't want to. They want the infrastructure to, to keep crumbling. They want unemployment rates to keep rising. And they want the homeless, uh, the homeless uh, uh, numbers to, to get even higher. They want more people on the streets. The middle class is, uh, is, is quickly evaporating. And you're going to start seeing more and more people who uh, are already one paycheck away from bankruptcy. It's really a sad state of affairs. And we absolutely do nothing about it to change it. So obviously, it, there's a economic flaw. There's a system flaw, okay, right across the board. Because if they got to keep pumping money into something, which the citizens see nothing of, then you know that the game is corrupt. So I want to talk about what is a, repurch, a repurchase agreement, which is short form for repo. We hear a lot, a lot about that in the news. And you're going to find this fascinating because I know I did. So, uh, I, and I'm not much of an economics guy, but I think it's important to talk about because it affects everybody, unfortunately. And it just goes to show that there is a tiny minority ruling the rest of us that we need to stop, okay? Now, the repurchase agreement, repo for short, is a form of short-term borrowing for dealers in government securities. In the case of a repo, a dealer sells government securities to investors, usually on an overnight basis, and buys them back the following day at a slightly higher price. That small difference in price is the implicit overnight interest rate uh, repos are typically used to raise short-term capital. They're also known, uh, sorry, they're also a common tool of central bank open market operations. Can you believe this? Government securities sold to investors, very low prices, and then sold back to the government at a higher price. If that's not a Ponzi scheme, I don't know really what is. I mean, this is incredible. And, you know, people don't take the time to read this stuff. This is how your economic system works. I mean, it's no different here in Canada. Uh, central banks, our, our Canadian Central Bank used to work for us, but not any longer. Now it's it's all private lenders. And, of course, our debt has skyrocketed because of it. And, and, and I mean, in America and anywhere else in the world, it's a freight train. Can't be stopped. The debt cannot be stopped. America right now is at 22 trillion, 23 trillion. And I'll show you the debt clock in a minute. But um, let me play a video for you. Now, this is the great Gerald Salente, which I, I mean, I highly respect this man. I really do. And he's a trend fo forecaster, sort, uh, sort of a, a, an economist, even though he doesn't, uh, he doesn't give financial advice. But he's going to explain that the whole system is essentially uh, uh, it's it's a house of cards ready to to break. It's it's ready to fall. So I'll play you this video here. They haven't recovered from the uh, panic of 08. They're they're still way down deep in the depths, and their their debt to GDP ratio is the highest among any way above uh, the other European countries. So there's no way out. And they're going to increase their debt regardless of what the ECB does. Because if you want to talk about hypocrisy, how about the ECB going to increase their, their debt? debt? By, By now, now, it's estimated that they after they meet next, next month, they're, they're going, going to lower interest, interest rates from, from minus 0.4% to minus 0.5% and increase the quantitative easing. They've already wasted nearly, what, $3 trillion and now they're going to be spending another 56 billion euros a month 
in quantitative easing. So who are they to point the finger at anybody? The global economy is going down. They're all injecting monetary methadone into it to keep the artificially addicted bull running. So, Gerald, is there so there you have it from uh, Mr. Gerald Salenti himself. And I couldn't agree with him uh, anymore. I mean, this guy knows economics very well. Okay, and this is the U.S. debt clock. And you can see it's just, uh, it's a freight train. It's, it, it, it won't stop. And it, it, it'll continue to go. I mean, I don't know how much more people can really uh, take this. It's, it's just, it's a fantasy. This whole economic system doesn't have to be this way. But it is, unfortunately, because a few benefit from it. As I was explaining to you in the other, uh, well, not in the article, but in the, uh, of the definition of a repo market, you can see that private investors buy cheap and then they sell back to the government at high prices. I mean, isn't that illegal? But according to them, it's not. It's, it's totally okay to do that. But if you and I were to do that, then, you know, it would be a crime. So look, guys, we can uh, we could talk about uh, solutions uh, uh, on how to salvage this economic system. But to be quite honest with you, there is no salvaging. When you have a banking system, a central banking system that has been hijacked, okay, and and it no longer works for the people, there is no point in talking about uh, in topping, uh, talking about saving that because there's nothing to save. It works well for the very few. What we need to do is. We need to take back our central banks on all levels of government. And they have to start loaning interest-free money to all states and provinces so that they can run their daily uh, budget operations. And, 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 of course, money for uh, infrastructure. And again, I, I, I keep stressing this, that money should have no interest whatsoever. This is why we have inflation. Okay. And not only that, but there are a tiny few that have cornered this, this banking system, this market, so to speak, because of the interest rates. And now uh, they, have, uh, they have created a monopoly, a monopoly of power over the rest of us, including the government itself. They tell the government basically what to do. I mean, we all know that. So, I mean, again, how do we change this? It's, it's quite simple. What we need to do is we need to find a system, a political system that works for everybody, that gives everybody a, a voice. And that system is direct democracy. Until the people start making the decisions directly on all the major issues, this Ponzi scheme, this uh, quantitative, quantitative easing, this, these repo markets, they will continue. And, and more people will get affected by it. Let's, let's not forget, I, forget to, I forgot to mention, as Gerald did, the next economic crash is going to be one that is going to rival the Great Depression of the 30s. Now, they call the 2008 one the, the, the Great Recession. This one is going to be worse than the Depression. Don't forget now that the, the, the globe is affected by the, the, the crash uh, or the next crash. Everybody will be affected by it. Uh, so we can prevent that by changing the system altogether. We need to get back to central banks like we once did. Because if we don't, then we're going to get the same, if not worse. And like I said, the next financial crash will be worse than the, the one in the 30s. So let's get together. Let's talk about it. And let's start uh, pushing ideas like direct democracy on all levels of government. Okay, guys, thanks for watching, and please share the video if you can. Please subscribe to our channel, Advocates for Direct Democracy. And until next time, thanks for watching.